Hello, BookTube. All right, I think we're on part four of our uh, August Q&A. Uh, we're up to Mr. Putler Gollum, who has a number of questions. Number one, uh, do does any of these authors have any good literature? Uh, okay, this, and it's a list of authors. And once again, I've cautioned against this many times on Q&As. This doesn't really work for Q&A. Uh, but let's see what we have here. Percival Everett, Emil Chirin, Thomas Bernard, Laszlo krasnor Harkey. Fernando Pessoa, yeah, they, they all. I've read great things that I really enjoyed from all of them. They require digressions. It doesn't, your, your, answer, your question doesn't do, the answer doesn't do any good for me to say yes. Because you immediately have follow-up questions and a, a QA and a is not a place for those follow-up questions. But you also have other questions. Let's see what your other questions are. Number two is, what English translation of Odyssey and Iliad do you recommend? Usually the uh, Fagels with the introductions by Bernard Knox. They make a really good package. Also, they're also physically beautiful books from Penguin. Uh, they, so they, they're the whole the whole thing. Uh, and number three, what's the best textbook about political ideologies? Conservatism, liberalism, libertarianism? I really don't know textbooks. I, 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 I really don't follow them. I follow popular political books, but they're usually not meaning to be comprehensive introductions to the subject, and I don't read textbooks. Uh, there are all sorts of books on these ideologies, but I, I, if you're talking textbook, you're talking about, I assume, about an introduction to them. And you have Wikipedia. I I'd easily recommend that over any book. St steep yourself in, the, in these subjects on Wikipedia. Follow all of the hot links. And then when you're done with that, that's a week's worth of effort right there. And when you're done with that, they'll, every one of those linked articles will have a huge reference section. It'll be much more profitable there than for you to read a book, to start with anyway. Uh, Steve Watson says, number one, what aspect of World War II history do you enjoy reading about the most? Paratrooping in Europe. Uh, number two, is there a battle or campaign or personality that still needs a Steve Squealy treatment? <laughs> a Steve Squealy treatment. No, unless maybe uh, there are plenty that I'm sure I've missed. But I, every major figure in World War II that I can think of, legitimately major, not, not 21st century box-ticking major, but every, every legitimately major figure in World War II history has had several major books, some of which, most of which, have been Steve Squealy. All the major generals on every side, all the major leaders on every side, all the major activists on every side, all the major politicians on every side. I've read enormous numbers of books about all of them, and a lot of them have been really good. I can't think of a, a lack. Uh, Let's see here. Caleb Bouchard says, what is your favorite literary work in translation that you've read this year? Well, that would be interesting to know, wouldn't it? If you're interested in that, you should definitely check out the list I make at the end of every year on the Steve Reads portion of Open Letters Review, which is free. It's online. Anybody can read it. At the end of the year, in December, I will be running down the best and worst books in the 16 or so genres that I read. One of the earliest categories that will be posted in early December will be works in translation. And there will be 10 items on there, and they won't be in any particular order except for number one. And number one on that list, coming up in a few months, will be the best work in translation that I've read so far this year. So I guess you know what you'll be reading in December, don't you? Uh, let's see here. Shelley Swearingen says, can you talk us through some of your favorite memoirs of the 21st century so far? Well, that's a starter kit. That's a, a separate discussion video. That's not anything I can do in a Q&A. That would take 20 minutes at least. Uh, there have been some good ones. Lots and lots of bad ones, but some good ones. In the 21st century, of course, uh, you get to write a memoir no matter how dumb, boring, derivative, or pointless your life has been. And if anyone says you can't, then they are a self-professed, active bigot against whatever larger group you are at that moment aligning yourself with. They don't get to have that opinion because it's true. They don't get to have that opinion because you're 22 and have never done anything with your life. They, the only reason that they're going to say that it's bad is because they are a bigot and have been a bigot their whole life. And in the 21st century, you get to just level that accusation against them. It's libel, slander, but you get to just do that offhand and then move on with your day. You don't even have to think about it. You just level the accusation against them. Once upon a time, the most serious thing that you could say about someone is something you'd better have been ready to back up. Or you'd lose all your friends in addition to all your, your legal funds. In the 21st century, it's how you say hello. Hi, bigot. <laughs> so anyway, what do you think of this, bigot? <laughs> so, uh, but once upon a time, <laughs> once upon a time, uh, you had to have a reason to write a memoir. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, let's just move on. Uh, Jack Ivoniak says, how familiar are you with computer literature? What do you mean by that? 
I know you've read what algorithms want. Yes, I've read it. I've read it a couple of times now. Uh, I, and I'm guessing you haven't read the C programming language. No, I haven't read any programming language in guides. But where between these would you say you venture into computer books? Well, anything that's that's for a popular audience, anything that's for a non-wonk audience. I'd like to think I'm open to reading any of those. I've had a, a lot of great reading experiences along those lines. Oh, wait, you have... Uh, it, uh, have you read It Hurts to Type That? Sorry. Yes, for those of you who are new to the channel, you are not to ask that question, okay? Have you read? You're not to ask that. I read 120, 150 pages an hour, and I read for 10 hours every day. And I have been for a lot longer than your parents have been alive, so you don't really get to do that. Uh, but you actually have suggestions here. Code by Charles Petzl. I haven't read that. Uh, the Cuckoo's Ed by Cliff Stoll. I did read that. Yeah, I read, I read that a long, when it first came out. I read it a long, long time ago. Uh, a Worm by Mark Bowden. What a book. Oh, 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 what a book. One of Bowden's best. And he's one of my favorite non general nonfiction authors. But Worm about the Conficker virus is incredible. He is so good at explaining things in that book. Oh, my. Even if you don't think you're interested in, in the nuts and bolts of, of hacking and code writing and computers, borrow a copy of, of Worm from your library. You will be spellbound. It's amazing. Oh, yes. All right. So, yeah, I try to read books like that. Absolutely. I, I don't always understand what I'm reading, but I try to read stuff like that. Uh, and related to that, could you pontificate on your personal experience seeing the rise of computers? Oh, well, I could, but this is like Charlie Swearing. This, this would take forever to do. I've, I've watched from the beginning. Went through all the usual stages that I think anybody would go through. I, I went through a long stage where I thought, this will never have anything to do with me. And then I went through, I, I went through a few introductions to computers. There was a computer lab at university. No one was ever expected to have one of their own. They certainly weren't expected to have one in their dorm room, but there was a lab you could go to. And I started slowly to acquaint myself with them. And then later on, I was introduced a couple of times by a couple of different people to the idea of maybe having my own computer. And that requires a huge jump in familiarization right there. If you're gonna have this thing on a desk, you have to know more about it than if it's in a lab with a, there's a technician standing right there to help you and so on and so forth right down to the to the present day the, the the equipment that i have now would have been a dream to me a fantasy i wouldn't have believed it at all i wouldn't have believed it was possible at all even 20 years ago i distinctly remember what it was like 20 years ago when i was completely dependent on a tech guy for help a tech friend i had one computer one laptop computer i didn't have anything else no phone no tablets no nothing like that i come up here Frida. come up here come on, all the way here. see your fans Oh, it's getting hot out there, isn't it, baby? Uh, I remember those days very much where if something went wrong with the computer, I had not the slightest idea of what to do. I had to just freeze. I had to just stop. No matter what I was doing, I had to just stop. Use the phone to call that one tech person and say, you know, can we meet at the Boston Public Library or a, a, a location of your convenience? And I was furious. The fury that comes from helplessness. I don't experience anything like that anymore. Not at all. Not for years. It, Technology has moved closer to a point where you're never going to be out in the cold like that. And also, I, I'm grudging to say it, but still, it's undisputably true. I have moved closer. I understand more through slow osmosis of learning. I understand more about how these things work. And the combination of the two, baby, there you go. The combination of the two uh, means that I don't ever experience that anymore. And I'm glad that my relationship with computers has evolved to that point. Because boy, oh boy, I remember those towering rages, and they're bad for you. Towering rage is bad for you just in general. It's bad for the lining of your heart. It's bad for your esophagus. It's bad for your stomach. I remember those towering rages. I am so glad that those days are gone. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, Royal Tube says, uh, at what time in your life did you become a vegan? What do you do? What do you think of people that make their dogs vegan too? I've been on and off, and I'm not. I'm not. Uh, ideologically doctrinaire anyway even now I'm not I'm if I'm a guest in someone's house and they serve me meat I will eat it and I won't I won't make any bones about it at all I won't try to make anybody else feel bad about it uh, because in one level me the meat eater rationale is true the thing is already dead the harm is already done the the idea that I have most of the time is don't actively support the industry well, you know, partaking of a meal or even having meat on a special occasion if I have guests here is not part, is not 
that is not you know you going every day to the market to get fresh meat that's keeping the industry alive a special occasion no and I, I i don't know what to do i don't know what to say about people who make their dogs be dogs aren't made to be vegan they're carnivores uh so you can do it and it can be balanced so that the dog is nice and healthy and happy and uh, you can get to the point where the owners will will at least be able to convince themselves that the dog doesn't know what it's missing <laughs> Uh, it's, it's easy to do that if you can't talk to the dog and there's only one two-legged thing on earth who can <laughs> but one way or another I don't bother with that I, I, I don't I don't bother with that at all I, I feed free to whatever I think she likes uh, let's see here Ruben Rodriguez uh, says hi Steve which poets match or exceed Shakespeare who did my teachers fail to teach me about? I assume most, as I barely learned about poetry in high school. I bet you have some great suggestions. Okay, all right, Ruben Rodriguez. Let's be absolutely sure of what we're talking about here. You said poets, not playwrights. Okay, let's be absolutely sure of that. Virtually no playwright in the history of humanity comes anywhere near Shakespeare at the peak of his form. So let's, let's make sure we draw a distinction between Shakespeare the poet and Shakespeare the playwright. Shakespeare idolaters, bardolaters are going to say there's no difference, he's the greatest in all things, he was the greatest doctor. <laughs> so, so he could could uh, 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 realign a dilithium crystal in two seconds like nobody's been anything like that. But I'm talking about real people here, I'm talking about a, a normal person's opinion. We draw a distinction. If we're talking about Shakespeare the poet, not Shakespeare the playwright, uh, then it's not a barren field. Uh, John Keats would certainly have become a greater poet than Shakespeare had he lived. Um, William Butler Yeats certainly was one, a much better poet than Shakespeare. I, just, eons better, just, an, an amazing, an amazing figure, an amazing work there. And maybe there would be others. I could probably, I could probably come up with others. I certainly think that Chaucer was a better poet than Shakespeare. Uh, I'd be willing to bet. I'd be willing to say that in some, in some cases, Petrarch was. Uh, but if we're talking poetry not playwrights i strongly recommend john keats i strongly recommend william butler yates strongly uh but anyway uh let's see here uh that's actually a good idea for a, a video on its own uh but anyway uh justin raymond uh says hi steve what is your opinion of mother Teresa? <laughs> was chris Richards right about her or was he too harsh uh i don't have a high opinion of mother. i didn't have a high opinion of her before Christopher Hitchens started to try to make money by bashing her. Uh, and keep in mind, I know there are a lot of Hitchenites out there. I know a lot of people have been down Hitchens rabbit holes and maybe still do. And I, I certainly had my share of admiration for the guy. But keep in mind, uh, he was a slave to attention. And 90%, uh, I would say, 80 to 90% of the reason why he went after Mother Teresa was because she was Mother Teresa, not because of his outrage at the things that she did. He listed a whole bunch of them. The, you know the list as well as I do if you've read The Missionary Position. And you can, if you read that little book about Mother Teresa, you can easily come up with 10 figures in Hitchens' own day who were doing all of the things on his list to an astronomically greater degree than Mother Teresa ever dreamt of doing those same offenses. And the reason Hitchens didn't go after them is because they weren't sacred cows. They weren't, there wouldn't have been the outrage. They wouldn't have gotten bookings. On Larry King and whatnot so you have to you have to keep that in mind with almost everything that Hitchens did when he at the end of his life when he was saying you know, about God is not great he was saying well this is the book I was born to write I've always been writing about this subject I've always hated organized religion had he lived Hitchensites would have seen him adapt that millenarian rhetoric to his next subject about the next subject, the next book, he would have said, well, I've been writing this book my whole life. I've always meant to fulminate against this. He said the same thing about the Clintons before he was saying religion poisons everything. And, and what do you mean by that? Do you mean literally everything? Before he was saying that about religion, he was saying exactly that about the evil of Bill Clinton, that it poisons everything. And so on and so forth. You just have to understand, he wanted book sales. He wanted the notoriety. A huge percentage there did. But even so, all of his accusations, I think, about Mother Teresa were largely true. I have a small vested interest in the opposition to a lot of those arguments. There is a bit of a connection with one of his most vociferous detractors on the subject of his criticism of Mother Teresa. Just check the surname. And <laughs> anyway, one way or another, 
Uh, it doesn't matter. I would have come to the conclusion anyway. It's overdone. But the point I'm trying to make is that all of Hitchens' criticism was overdone. All of it was, was overdone in order to get bookings, in order to get attention. But none of it was wrong. None of it was invented. None of it was, was, was just unfabricated. Mother Teresa was... Well, I, the main the main point on which I really I really feel Hitchens thinking about her the the one of the main responses of his to her that I thought was totally genuine was his genuinely convicted feelings about her later confessionary writings where she just outright admitted that she was being used by the Catholic Church that so she didn't hold a lot of the deep faith that she felt she should he read a lot of those things and I won't say that he felt sympathy for his former target. But he did feel a genuine conflict in reading what clearly struck him as honest soul searching, and there is where we come. The, he and I come the closest, because I felt that too. Reading, I, reading her stuff like that, the, the writings like that, it felt like this was a confused person who was maybe being used by lots of other people who weren't at all confused about what they wanted. Oh, I'm sorry, that was a very long, convoluted answer. Hitchens tends to bring that out in me. Uh, let's move on to Colin Rafferty. Uh, I would like to hear your thoughts on Charles Moore's three-volume authorized biography of Margaret Thatcher. Oh, my. All right, well, uh, we'll make sure Martine is out of the room. <laughs> but uh, I love it. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And it gets more brilliant as it goes along. Not just in terms of the exhaustive research and not just in terms of the validation that it is for what I always say that there is worth to be found in authorized biographies. A lot of times people will say, well, if it's an authorized biography, then the people who own the literary estate are going to be cleaning up. They're going to be giving orders to the biographer. You can mention this, but you can't mention that. You have to whitewash this. You have to downplay that. And I always want to say to those people, what if somebody came to you? What if you were famous? Somebody came to you and said, all right, well, we want to hire an authorized biographer. What are they not allowed to touch? What parts do, uh, do they have to whitewash? You yourself would instantly say, let them do it all. Let them research everything and let the chips fall where they may. You wouldn't in a million years authorize that. And yet people are so quick to say that about other literary estates. I've never understood that, and I haven't found a lot of that in authorized biographies and in, in Moore's Thatcher book. The three volumes are incredible. Just incredible. I cannot recommend them strongly enough. Not just in terms of their honesty and the amazing amount of research that went into them, but also about the prose, which many critics have commented on. The prose is just superb just just superb and it gets better as it goes along so i'm not sure that margaret thatcher rates a three volume biography i'm not sure that that's true but if anybody does in the modern era then she does and i i would say read the second and third books at least but if you're definitely interested in the subject read all three an amazing reading experience okay martine can come back into the room now <laughs> uh let's see here the abiding badger i wonder where you were uh you never miss a q a uh, let's see here. What do you think of the concept of representation? Do you think that this push to have fiction reflect the reader is at all necessary? No, of course. Not only is it not necessary, it's directly harmful to the direct wellsprings of what fiction actually is. It, it goes straight to the DNA of what fiction actually is and attacks it, wants to rewrite that DNA to look like you. That will kill fiction. And it's already killing fiction. We're already seeing it, right? How much fiction is there in the current market, in the upcoming market, let's say, for the American book market, for modern, contemporary, non-genre literary fiction, so-called literary fiction? Let's say for the next three months. The lists are all, are all out for all of that. Take all of those books from, let's say, the top six publishers. So you take all of those books from all of those publishers and you add them together. Let's say you're going to get, let's say the figure is 250 books between now and the end of the year in new release, high profile, major publisher, literary fiction. Of those 250 books, almost all 250 are auto fiction. And almost all of that 250 pieces of auto fiction, in other words, no invention on the part of the author, I'm just writing down my own experiences because there's no story more important than me. Out of all those 250, almost all of them have acknowledged or industry known sensitivity readers who are racist hired by the publisher to make sure other racists don't feel slighted. In other words, all of it is being, is being governed by representation, by representation where you, it is now completely expected that you will be not only reflected in the stuff that you write, but the only thing in it. And people are hired by your publisher to make sure that other people will see themselves reflected in what you do. It won't be a question of meeting the work on its own merits. 
Instead, you'll have to meet it on your merits. You'll have to decide if it reflects enough of you to be worthwhile. That is the death of fiction. And there'll be plenty of people out there not watching this channel, thank God. But there'll be plenty of people out there who will say, well, the only reason that you think that way is because you have always been represented. You're a cishet white man, so you've always been represented in literature, so of course you're going to be complacent on the subject. But, but I, you know, as a cisgender, one side of the head shaved Ashanti woman, have never been represented, represented in a Dickens novel. <laughs> Uh, I would say, no, none of those people are watching this video, but if, I, if they were, I would say, if any of them were foolish enough to debate with me, that will never happen. I would never take the invitation. Uh, but if I were to have the conversation with one of them instead of running from them the way I do, because insanity is communicable, I would say, that's not how this works at all. And the reason why you don't care that you are so fundamentally misunderstanding it is because you don't care about books. You don't care about books. This is not about books. You don't care about books. You don't care about representation in literature because you don't care about literature. Now, never you mind that I've seen myself reflected in literature all along because I've been a Florentine nobleman plenty of times, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I've been a Greek warrior on the sandy plains of Troy. Yeah, plenty of times. No, never mind that. Never mind that. Never mind those stupid counter accusations. The reason why this bothers me is because it doesn't mean anything to you. People, the people who hold this opinion don't care about literature. The people who hold these, these opinions about representation of uh, trans or disabled or otherly abled or Latin X, whatever that is, or maybe a mutant Latino, whatever it is, the people who claim to have those opinions don't care about books. They don't care about books. They talk about representation in fiction. They don't care about fiction. They don't read it. They don't recommend it to others. They don't care about it at all. This is only about power. It just uh, the books are just a venue and that's not true for me I actually do care about the books I care about almost nothing else with a couple of tiny exceptions I care about almost nothing else so I've, I've, I've lost I've, I've gone into a red haze of rage and lost track of your question let's see if we can find your question uh, do, uh, what do I think about the concept of representation it's ridiculous it's totally solipsistic it's totally self-absorbed and the 21st century doesn't need any help being totally self-absorbed. It's already totally self-absorbed. Uh, and do you think the push for fiction to reflect the reader is necessary? No, not only is it necessary, but it's badly deleterious to fiction. It will kill fiction. It has already mostly killed fiction. And it will kill the rest of it if we don't put a stop to it. We are not going to put a stop to it, so... Anyway, <laughs> let's just move on. The Abiding Badger has once again stirred the pot. Uh, so let's, let's move on to Vera Pavlova. Uh... Any details about Proustober? Oh my. Uh, we're not going to read all 4,000 pages in a month, are we? Well, I don't know about we. I am. Uh, but the Proustober, for those of you who don't know what uh, Vera Pavlova is talking about, I'm talking about an event in which I try, for what I hope is the last time, to m get remembrance of things past in search of lost time. Marcel Proust. To get him, as opposed to not getting him. As opposed to having continuing to have FOMO about the biggest literary event that I have FOMO about. I want to get him, or I want him to get out. I want Proustober in October to be the time when that happens. I don't know if it's going to happen. I don't know how well it's going to work. I don't know one way or another. I want to recommend uh, Matthew at Maybury Book Club did a video just today about reading a small chunk of Remembrance of Things Past, and the video is wonderful. So if you can put up with the... His, he has a, a cat that's the size of Godzilla in the old Japanese animation movies. You have to be so you have to be ready for a cat that looks like a human in a cat suit because it's that big. If you're ready for that, <laughs> Sheriff Andy Taylor makes a cameo appearance. Uh, then it's a wonderful video. Uh, but Bruce Tober is, is still a go. <coughs> so let's see, extra hero. Another question from extra heroes. That's the only good ones. So uh, has any author or publisher tried to retaliate against you? for something you've said in a review or a book haul? What a great question. Well, I hope you show up in the next Q&A. You, you ask great questions. Uh, no. No, it's never happened. Nope. I've been lucky that way. I, I, I don't know if it's only luck. I think an old friend of mine used to say you, that you don't have to know you. Nobody has to know you. They just have to read something that you're paying attention while you write to know that you're ready for a fight. Maybe even that you're Irish enough to be looking forward towards one. A lot of people don't want that. 
especially in the 21st century. In the 21st century, an expression of, dis, of displeasure on the part of some uh, blue-haired checkmark on Twitter is supposed to end the discussion. I have expressed that I am displeased. You are now going to cringe, retreat, and apologize and change everything about your life because I have expressed that I am not, that I am displeased. Those people melt like dew in the morning if they, if they encounter someone who gives off the idea that they want to fight, that they want to destroy an opposing opinion. And I try in book reviews, I try really hard. Uh, I mean, the videos are different because in videos, I, we, we are having a conversation and we know you, the people who watch this channel know perfectly well. There are no set the things in stone here. You're perfectly free to disagree with me. I'm perfectly free to disagree with you. And that especially applies to books that I'm encountering for the first time in a mail hall. I'm giving you a first impression and constantly telling you my impression could change. I'm not reading the book. I'm reading about the book and talking about it with you. It's only so that I can put those, you know, so we can have an impression of that book. It's not so that we can have a final judgment about that book. So that's one thing. The videos I don't think are a problem because we're all adults here. And we're all having we're having a conversation about these things you know that's how it goes uh when it comes to reviews a review is a final judgment on my part it is it is my verdict on something and i try really really hard to have my ducks in a line before i do that i take it very seriously and i don't know if that comes through or maybe i'm just too small fry maybe, maybe i'm just too small fry i've never had anybody try to retaliate against anything no not at all <laughs> no not at all i don't know what retaliation would be I've had people write in to editors and say, you got a detail wrong, factual detail wrong. That sometimes happens, no matter how careful you are. I've had people do that. That's not retaliation, though. I'm, that might be Wormwood, but I appreciate it. Uh, I've also had people write to me. I'm easy to find. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not behind a privacy wall like so many of my fellow critics are. I'm easy to find. I want people to find me. I've had authors write to me privately and say, I don't think you got my book. I don't think your review is particularly fair. I want to talk about this point with you. They've never gone so far as to ask for an, a retraction or an apology or anything like that. It's just that I think a negative review probably hurt their feelings. And in the 21st century, thanks to the internet, they can vent to me. They can vent to the person who hurt their feelings. That's perfectly fine by me. I don't feel violated by that at all. I don't think that of that as retaliation. To me, retaliation would be uh, the same thing as privacy on the internet. You know, I don't go to extravagant lengths to protect my privacy on the internet. And people have sometimes over the years said, well, why don't you? God help us. Aren't you afraid? And I always say, if, if you're going to do something with the information that you have about me, whether you're a disgruntled author or a viewer or whatever, you're going to have to break the law. We don't live in the Wild West. We don't live in the middle of the neutral zone. If you're going to retaliate in the way that I think this question is talking about, you're going to have to break the law. I have a lawyer who's a good friend of mine who'd like nothing better than for you to break the law. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm covered in that way. And I, I, I am laboring under the Quixote-esque delusion that most people are completely decent and would never think about such a thing. I, I, always, I always am mystified by flamethrowers in the comment section of this channel. It almost never happens. But every once in a while it does, and I'm always mystified by that. Who wouldn't, if you watch even one video on this channel, who wouldn't rather just jump into a conversation and have all these new friends, who some of whom don't agree with you, some of whom do agree with you, some of whom think you're wrong, some of whom think you're uh, as wrong as Brian and Bookish. <laughs> Why wouldn't you do that as opposed to just making enemies and leaving? I never understood that. And I think that air really comes across in pretty much everything I do. So I don't get a lot of it. I don't, I don't get a lot of... I've had far, far more authors contact me in some way or another, either directly or through an editor, and say, that was a good point that you made. I was sloppy on that, on that aspect of the book. That you, It was right for you to point that out. Thanks for the good things you said. I've had far more authors say that than have been rancorous in any way. Uh, let's see here. Nick Piccarelli uh, says, number one, what do you think of the Master and Commander movie? It's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, number two, what could you share a little bit about your experiences with wolves? I've had many, many experiences with wolves. It, they've been wonderful. You go deep, deep into wolf country and then just wait. Just call for them. They're very vocal. They're right out there and they know you're there. Believe you me, they know you're there. They would know I was there anyway, but I was always in their country with a big crowd of dogs. That makes it even more obvious that they know you're there. Uh, but they are my babies too. Every one of them. And uh, it's not an experience most of you will have. 
but to put your hand onto the chest, or better yet, lay your head on the chest of a full-grown timber wolf is incredible. First of all, your hand sinks into the fur. It's deep shag carpeting, it, and you can definitely feel how much it's protecting them. And the sheer power of that heartbeat. Oh, man. Oh, man. I, I could go on and on in a video sharing my experiences, but I, it, it's, it breaks my heart to think I'm never going to meet a wolf again. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's, let's see here. Jim's Books, Reading, and Stuff says, Who is your favorite writer in the Western genre? Well, you know, the big names. There's Louis L'Amour, Mark Richardson's beloved Louis L'Amour. There's Larry, Larry Murchie, who wrote a lot of great Westerns, including one of, a great American novel that's a Western. Uh, and there's Elmore Leonard, the mystery author, whose Westerns are incredible. They're incredibly good. His short stories and his novels are incredibly good. But for me, I think my favorite is Lauren Esselin. I honestly do. I think I think I like his. I've liked more of his westerns than I have people who are much more famous nowadays at westerns. Lauren Esselman never really. He never really broke into the A list, uh, but I, I think it's his that I that I prefer the most. Uh, that no no offense intended there, Charles Portis. No offense intended to True Grit. True Grit is a great novel. But people can write a great novel and still not be the greatest at a genre. That requires sort of a batting average. And I think Esselman has that. Uh, let's see here. IDIC Warrior Reads says, I look forward to these. A quick question. What is your opinion on the British TV series The Avengers? Also, have you watched the epic Russian adaptation of War and Peace directed by Bondichurk? Uh, I never really got into the, the Avengers. I love the, the two main stars, but I, I never really espionage stuff like that never really did anything for me and i've never seen this adaptation of war and peace should i is it really good uh all right we're going to stop there and we're going to move on i think to part five i'll keep track of them in the video titles don't you worry